I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've been thinking about you all uh, for quite a while without knowing who the you behind the you all is. Um, so it's great to be up here and seeing you. Um, I want to thank Sandy uh, and Diane and, and Jim for the invitation and uh, Olivia, who I understand is part of uh, the reason I'm here too. And I just want to say how grateful I am to be here uh, to talk about some really important stuff that doesn't always get talked about. Uh, to have hearts open and ears open. There's only so much I can do with my mouth <laughs> and the words there. But I do believe in a Holy Spirit that can give great power to those words if I'm faithful and we're ready to receive it. So if you are a praying type um, and there are moments of silence and space, uh, please do feel free to, to pray for, for the descent of that spirit, which is so beautiful. Uh, I will um, be talking to you today uh, f from the spirit, which is to say I haven't uh, prepared the talk as a talk that like, I could hand to you. I have way too many notes on my uh, trusty, uh, as the French say, table, um, and I can't read them all, and I don't intend to. They're here so that if I'm quoting people, uh, I quote them correctly, and whatever gets read from here, whether it's a 80% or 0% will be just right, I hope. And so if there are periods of in-between when we're quiet, I'm trying to listen for what was supposed to be happening. This is a traditional way of friends practicing um, vocal ministry. And while I am uh, going to attempt to be on topic, uh, I do understand this is ministry. I think that you are all called into some really powerful work and want to meet you there. I was a... Uh, I was initially asked to come, as Diane mentioned, to speak about the topic of uh, history and moments of Quaker advocacy. And, and, and my understanding of that was it going to be an attempt to articulate how it is that the current work of FCNL and uh, in, in lobbying in general and the work of uh, lobbying and acting for peace is an extension or, or a connection of the historic practices uh, and actions of members of the Religious Society of France, which is my tradition. Uh, another way to ask this question is, how is this, what we're doing, related to how it is that friends were engaged in working towards abolition far before the law changed, which allowed white folk to claim ownership over their African brothers and sisters? How is this like that? And I think this is a great question in a, in a nation that is increasingly polarized in terms of our policies and politics, it's full of bureaucratic acronyms and uh, confusion systems for political engagement. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're denying people access to control, to information. How are we supposed to be relating to the government and to our policies in a way that's like, for example, uh, the story of John Woolman, who is a, a, a Quaker minister who traveled all over the eastern seaboard and, and, and England as well, carrying a message for abolition a hundred years before the American Civil War forced the issue of slavery. How is this like that? How, how is our, our vocal outcry against continued operations in, in Guantanamo, how is that like the fierceness of uh, Lucretia Mott who was an abolitionist who not only refused to use cotton and sugar because of the role that slavery played in their production, but began to organize women to fight for abolition when forward-thinking anti-slavery organizations refused to accept female members. All right, there's a double one there. Not only was she engaged in the move for abolition, when the men wouldn't let her in the room because the freedom of abolition was for men to be talking about, not women, she said no. This is for us all to be engaged in. How is this like that? Is our concern for, for privacy and, and the power of the uh, National Security Agency, for example, is that cut from the same cloth as the pioneering vision of someone like, um, like William Turk, who uh, not only spearheaded a revolution for the treatment of the mentally ill in England, but was also one of the very few Englishmen to speak about what horrible things the East India Trading Company would do in India. 
Now, I have to imagine that was an incredibly unpopular thing to mention. But he mentioned it. How is this like that? Well, I think that it is, um, it's well and good to be inspired. Uh, perhaps, I'm, I'm less sure about this, perhaps it's even okay to be proud of what has come before. But I firmly believe that, that if we attempt to model ourselves on the actions of the past, we're going to run out of steam. Um, another way to say this is I don't think that our history should be our model. I don't. Um, I was a public school teacher for quite some time in, in high schools and middle schools, and I always used to think about this, this, uh, this line. Uh, it's from Amos Bronson Alcott. That's the, the father of Louisa May Alcott. Um, he was a, a big kind of education guy. And uh, with some, some modification, I think this quote is very applicable to, uh, to our situation. He says, the true teacher defends her pupils against her own personal influence. The teacher inspires self-trust. She guides her students' eyes from herself to the spirit that quickens her. She will have no disciples. So listen to that again. The true teacher defends her pupils against her own personal influence. She inspires self-trust, and she guides their eyes from herself to the spirit that quickens her. She will have no disciples. Right? So, so we're not supposed to turn, at least if, if we're listening to Alcott, to these historical friends and look at them as teachers if, if that means we're stopping at them in their actions. We are supposed to be allowing our eyes to be guided from them to the spirit that quickens. We, we're tracking this, yeah? If it's possible to do that, then I think that we are, in fact, engaged in an extension of the power and the tradition in which the Religious Society of Friends has its roots. If we can allow our eyes to slip off of these figures to the spirit which quickens. We'll take a look at some stories in a tricky attempt to do this. So we're going to do like a... Like a double hop. We're going to talk about some people, um, but I don't want us to just focus on those people. I want to focus on how those people were focused on the spirit. So we're doing like, a, like an M, right, or king me or something. So we're going to look at some folks and how they looked at something. I feel like we should all just like do this. Um, <laughs> so um, we're going to start with John Woolman because a lot of folks uh, often reference Woolman as, a, as an important figure. And I want to just kind of bring everyone up to speed um, with some uh, short factoids about him. So if you're not a friend or were raised without an awareness of this guy, you can kind of be on the same uh, page. So I have listed here what I have titled in my notes, a rundown of his awesomeness. Uh, some of it's less than awesome. He was born in New Jersey, for example. <coughs> I'm sorry if you're from Jersey. Um, he was born in 1720 uh, in New Jersey. And I, this, I, this is one of my favorite Woolman things because uh, in his journal in later years, <laughs> he writes in there, and this is like the, I wish this to all of you that keep journals that you write things like this so that hundreds of years later someone finds it and thinks it's this great. He writes in the journal that before, this is a quote, before I was seven years old, I began to become acquainted with the operations of the divine love. Now, I don't know about you, but like, I couldn't even spell divine love at seven, <laughs> let alone like, be able to become acquainted with the operations of it. I, I actually still don't even know what that means. Um, but I think it's probably good, so we'll stay there. Uh, so before he's seven, he's operating in divine love. Oh, by the way, if you need a, a name for a cover band, I think the operations of divine love is free. Um, uh, in, in 1759, Woolman um, is very troubled uh, between the wars of the English and the French. And, and he's traveling in the ministry 
uh, uh, released from his meeting, and he wants to go into uh, the, the First Nations uh, territory. And in the journal, he later recounts this story. And, and, not, and you know, how do we know uh, outside of uh, a time machine, I suppose? So if any of you guys have the hookup, let me know. Um, he says in his journal that there was a period of time where he was worshiping with uh, the leader there of these folks near the Susquehanna River, uh, part of uh, the Hallucing area. And uh, the, the name, this guy was uh, Papa Nuhang, and he had an interpreter there who could speak the language that this uh, tribal leader spoke. And they were in communication trying to ease tensions regarding the way that the English and the French and the native folks were all connected to one another. And the story goes that at some point in time, the interpreter stopped interpreting for woman, and, and some words of vocal ministry he continued without translation. And the tribal leader, um, this is just a beautiful thing, he, uh, he came and placed his hands on woman's chest, and he said, I love to feel where the words come from. Right, the spirit that quickens. In 1762, um, woman stopped wearing dyed garments because he was told that dyes were produced by slave labor. Right? It was an early version of fair trade. He generally tried to abstain from the use of any product connected with the slave trade at all. And in a move towards kind of radical ordering under the gospel and his understanding of ministry, um, he took a profession, a job, that would allow him to travel in the ministry primarily. Um, so he became a very good uh, <laughs> uh, merchant and a business owner, and he was very trustworthy, so more and more people wanted to come to him. Uh, and once that happened, he began to tell them to go somewhere else because it would take too much of his time to be that good so that he would have time free to continue to work in the ministry. I think that's a, that's a critique and a question for us. Um, do we make space to do the things we're supposed to be doing, or do we keep ourselves busy with the things that other people say we do well? He says, though my natural inclination was towards merchandising, Yet I believed truth required me to live more free from outward encumbrances. Now, most of us don't talk that way and or don't feel inclinations towards merchandising. Uh, but I think there's something in that for us. We may have inclinations about what we might like or want or be skilled at. And the question is, is that what truth is calling us to? He sometimes gets called a Quaker saint. There's a number of books in the 50s and 60s that kind of did this. John Woolman, comma, Quaker saint, comma, abolitionist, or versions thereof. And I don't think that he would have liked that really much at all. Um, he, he has this, this story where, in talking about his ministry, you know, I'm sure even at the time, and it happens today, people say, wow, uh, such and such a person is really profoundly gifted, um, you know, yay for them. But he said his entire life in the ministry was like walking on cobblestones in the mist. He would take one step that was firm, have no idea where to go, and wait until the mist receded just enough so he could take one more step. And his entire life was one step, one step, one step. He wasn't, as far as I could tell, driven by some set of legislative agendas. He was not driven by a manifesto. He wasn't driven by a list of values. He was driven by the experience of affirmation that a more just world was possible. He was driven by the experience that a just world was possible. He was not against those who saw things differently than him. He was for living into the power that takes away the occasion for all war. It's sometimes easy 
to allow yourself against something. I'm not for this. I'm not for that. I'm not for this. Well, what are you for then? What you're for is against something. And I think woman calls us to be for life. Or this power of the spirit that quickens, that takes away the occasion for all war. In um, the ancient day of 1982, uh, this guy named Alfred uh, Lamott wrote this passage about John Woolman. And I, I think it's spot on. I was in, uh, preparing for worship one morning and I read this passage in a, a kind of daily Quaker text, and it just knocked me on my socks. And all day long, it just kind of was pulsing in my head. And um, as I've continued to kind of work and think about what is going to be happening here all with you, this passage kept returning to me. I said, this is an important piece for these folks. So I'm going to read this to you. This is uh, Alfred uh, Lamott. He says, Woman experienced the mystical presence of God long before it ever occurred to him that slavery was unethical. Right? This is not some uh, holy saint of a man who knew the moment he was born that slavery was wrong and this was his life mission. Right? Lamott says, he experienced the mystical presence of God long before it ever occurred to him that slavery was unethical. Then one day, in his retail office, someone asked him to write out a receipt for a slave, and suddenly he was revolted. He was revolted because something in woman's consciousness, sorry, conscience, as a result of his spiritual consciousness, became aware of the terrible horror that slavery was. And so he didn't write the receipt. That was the first act. It wasn't the beginning of a giant campaign. He just refused to write the receipt. He said, I can't. It was a personal matter. He wouldn't put his name on that. And gradually, he began to speak to his friends, to his meetings, to his quarterly meeting, yearly meeting about freeing slaves. His ethics spontaneously grew out of his spiritual sensitivity. No one pressured him to join a committee against slavery. <laughs> he did not start with an ethical ideal of human rights and go to meeting in order to talk about his ethical ideal. It happened the other way around entirely. He went to worship to be present with spirit, and in that silence, spirit left him with his ethic of change. So ethics begins in this story in an awareness. It's, it's in an awareness of this heightened consciousness where, where we meet with spirit, where your faithfulness calls you forth into the world for a reason that you are compelled to because of the experience that says you have to. You're all here instead of somewhere else because you feel like you have to be. I would encourage you to think that if someone in your life is calling you, you make sure that you listen first to the spirit that quickens and move there because that's going to be more important. It's going to call you into the power that lets you change things. When you're fully present to that inner teacher, you're on holy ground. Your mind is is naked, it's stripped bare. Time gets naked. You just are present. What's important is that when you are called in that space, you respond to it. Real values, says Lamont, are not learned. They form in you from the inside out. They cannot be imposed if they are to live. So the essence of our ethical development must be in that silent space where we meet the spirit. How else can we learn with such intensity how to be present, how to be for justice, how to be here, fully human, brothers and sisters one to another, now? Now, I am distinctly not saying that you all need to be Quakers. <laughs> Although, if you are interested <laughs> and you all want to jump ship, I think I win an award or something. <laughs> so think about that. Um, 
But so if I'm not saying that Quakers hold some secret uh, social justice uh, power, we don't. Uh, what am I saying? What I'm saying is, I think there's part of our tradition that absolutely focuses on the necessity to be convicted. You and God, you and spirit, you and the light, the inner teacher. This is a very long list of things that we call this thing. <laughs> the divine. And have that be the first motion. Don't do it because someone told you to. Unless that someone is God. Which I guess can happen. So there's two issues, though, with all of this. Okay. So... Woman's talking about the motion of love. He, uh, he talks about the motion of the heavenly power. This is very lovely language, but like what the heck is it? <laughs> so what does it make sense in our contemporary setting? What does all this lovely flowery spiritual language actually mean in terms of tomorrow and the next day? So that's the first thing. What does this language mean in terms of contemporary uh, period? And second of all, how is this applicable in the context of lobbying? of the legislative process of policy. So we're gonna take a look at both of those um, one at a time. So the first thing is, how can we understand this motion of love stuff uh, in our contemporary setting? And uh, in my notes, this is also labeled the, I can't just walk around the East Coast sleeping in barns and telling people to consider if drone warfare is a motion of love, can I, problem. <laughs> if some of you are interested in doing this, let's talk. Uh, I think that would be fascinating. It probably would be some interesting media attention. Got a good pair of shoes. Um, I want to talk now, um, in terms of the contemporary period, about something called the Alternatives to Violence uh, Project. Are any of you aware of AVP? Can you see hands? Awesome. So we're going to do like a split of this so people can kind of get uh, the, the primer on it. Uh, in 1966, this guy named Larry Apsey um, <laughs> awoke in the middle of the night. Again, we have to take his word for it. And at 2 a.m., I, I don't – often in these spiritual stories, people know exactly the minute when something happened. And I've never been able to, like, track down the moment. And, and if I have, it certainly would have been exactly at 2. So it's already under some suspicion. But exactly 2 in the morning, uh, Larry uh, Apsey in a uh, – period of meditation and prayer received this. Do not plan in order to make the project grow. Follow the light from day to day and let the project do its own growing. Deadlines and goals do not have to be met by you. You are a tool for the spirit. Your task is the same whether humble or great. I, I wish that God intervened in my life and told me to ignore deadlines, first of all. That's the, <laughs> that's the best part about this as far as I'm concerned. Um, the trippy part about this for me is the, the Hollywood version of this, right, would have been Larry working on something for years and having a lot of stress about it, and all of a sudden God's like, don't worry, like it'll be okay. The reality is, uh, Lori writes, uh, Lori, Maybe he's trans as well. Uh, Larry uh, says he didn't even know what the project in question was. So he, it's like he gets this divine telegram. He's like, don't worry about the project. And he's like, what project? <laughs> so there's a piece of me that wonders if, like, the subtext of this story isn't, like, blind terror. <laughs> Build the ark. <laughs> Uh, I, in all honestness, though, I think that this is sometimes how it works, right? So there's this clear vision, drops in his lap at 2 a.m., 2.01, he rounded down. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about the project, Larry. I got your back. But follow the light. Well, he began to do prison work, and I, I don't know enough about him or the story to know how much he was tracking his 2 a.m. Uh, burning bush moment with what he was doing. But he was engaged in the prisons in New York. I'm from New York yearly meeting, and uh, Larry was there as well. He began to um, worship and work and help train people in nonviolence in a Greenhaven prison. Um, 
he met a man on the inside there named uh, Roger Whitfield. And Roger was like, you need to help us get better at nonviolence, us on the inside. And the beginning of AVP was men on the inside and folks on the outside working together as teams to train people in nonviolence. That was 1975. It was 66 when the 2 a.m. thing happened. Today, workshops in alternatives to violence, trainings in the practices of nonviolence are offered in communities and schools and businesses and churches. There's about 1,000 workshops every year in federal, state, and local prisons. There's 14,000 participants in 30 states in the U.S. who lead these. There's 1,400 facilitators inside the prisons, men and women, and 600 community volunteer facilitators on the outside. And programs have happened in Canada, Mexico, England, Ireland, on and on and on and on and on. No deadlines. Don't fret it. Follow the light, Larry. I think sometimes, I think sometimes we hear this language of spirituality and the power of waiting in the light, and there's a part of us that's like, well, that sounds like a lot of sitting around, holier than thou. I want to do something. Now, here's the challenge that I think the tradition offers us you will be forced into doing something and you will be led into it. Trust. Begin first with the motion of love and know that you will be propelled forth into the world with something holy and wonderful and righteous to do. But start first in that listening. Um, I, I have the great pleasure of um, being the acquaintance of a woman named Nadine Hoover. Um, I don't know if any of you know Nadine, but she is about as gifted as they come, and she would hate me saying that, but she's not here so I could say it. She works um, in Indonesia as a trainer for alternatives to violence, and she's told me the story that there was a period in time, she'd been working there for years, where there were um, kind of domestic guerrilla terrorists living in the mountains who were uh, engaging in acts of violence against illegal logging that was happening in the, the forests of Indonesia. And like, what a, what a horrible, twisted situation. Indonesians and Indonesians were fighting and killing one another, blowing up uh, lumberjack equipment. And why was it happening? Well, because the developed West needed the wood for cheap from Indonesia, right? So we have global economic, political systems forcing peoples to fight one another. And Nadine Hoover from Western New York, who speaks Indonesian and knows the area, is there to train them in nonviolence. <laughs> And she said to me, and I will, I will never forget this, that she was right in my face. And if any of you know Nadine, that's sometimes how Nadine is. She said, Khaled, if all I could do was tell them to trust, no one would believe me for a second. They wanted those machines exploded. They wanted those men dead. They wanted the trees to stay there. And if all I could do is be like, no, it's okay, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. The reason that fighting stopped and those people are together is because there's actually a power that they can feel. And there are things that we can do to help people experience this holy power. It's nothing that we say. It's how we guide their eyes to the spirit that quickens. I think I think the experience of this holy power is, is a lot like what Larry uh, Apsey experienced in 66. I think it's like Woolman. Um, Woolman writes, uh, I have recently had renewed evidence that when I am faithful on God, I have learned this lesson over and over. I must look less at the effects of my labor and look more to moving with the motion of heavenly love. Again, it's lovely. We could just roll our eyes and say, that's great. But I want us to, for a moment, just consider the possibility that if instead of concerning ourselves with our labor and its effects, we turn first to the motions of heavenly love, what would happen then?
Now, what's crazy is trying to conceive of what this looks like in 2014 and you and you and you and you and all of your lives. What does this look like for you? It's much more complicated. We have to be aware of the contexts of class, of gender, of race and privilege, of, of sexism and all the other kinds of things that are systemic and horrid. It is one thing for me to read the journal of John Woolman and hear him advocating to me that I should move first in love or to hear about Nadine's work in Indonesia where she has spent years connecting to people. It is a very different thing for me to approach one of my peers and tell them they're too angry for activism. They must first start in love. There are social dynamics at play if a white man, however well-intentioned, tells, for example, a person of color to calm down and let love be the first motion. Yeah? So what are we supposed to do then, right? <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Well, friends have often quoted from T the book of Titus um, 3.2. It's, uh, speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, and show courtesy to everyone. It's this it's very the kind of niceness of Quakers is often there. But I don't think, and I, I can't imagine that that is supposed to force us to, to police people's tones or emotional states. We have advocated community and connection, but at some point in time, somehow do not plan to make the project grow and seek after the pure motion of heavenly love and experience the holy power of yes in life they have to result in significant changes in the political and social landscapes or we've done nothing. Those phrases, those lovely phrases, which could easily be written off as naive or hollow, they are at the pulsing center of actions and people that resulted in international organizations and good works. It seems as if sometimes at least, following this heavenly motion does something. It produces FCNLs. AVPs, any number of organizations that you work for or will work for or will found. But it requires us to trust that those things will emerge. So I'm not advocating that we just act nicely and gently and suddenly the world will get better. I, I mean, I think the world will be better if we are nice and gentle. But that is not sufficient. It's something else. So, so what's the thing? What's the connection? What is the touchstone that brings the life of these friends to this room today? What's the thread that we can chase from Fox, George Fox, and Margaret Fell through John Woolman and Neil Hoover to Saturday, uh, March 22nd, uh, 2014? And I want to suggest that the thing that draws us all together is a reliance on a wholly transforming power that the early friends identified as the Spirit of God or the seed from which new life and hope might emerge, or oftentimes today, the light. So this is a concrete emotional encouragement for you. This is George Fox in 1658, and I think he's talking to us today. He says, if you look down at sin and corruption and distraction, you will be swallowed up into it. Instead, look to the light and you will see over that sin. And then you will be given victory and you will find grace and strength. That's a real thing Fox is saying to do. Let's not get caught up in the things that we are against. We will stand against them and they will stop and we will act to bring their end. But let us not get caught up and being against them. Let us instead be for justice. Before what our tradition calls the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Inside all of these lovely phrases, there's something pragmatic pulsing. When when we're in romantic relationships, um, sexual connections are often a part of romance. Well, I hope that they are for you. <laughs> and I think it's great. 
uh, sexual connections. But the thing is that the one leads from the other, right? You're in this relationship and you have this kind of physical intimacy. But if you begin to seek out that sexual intimacy for its own sake, without tending to the connection which gave rise to it, eventually the relationship itself will become challenging and potentially break apart. If you haven't had this experience, I hope you'd never do. If you, had, if you have had it, I'm sorry. But we sometimes do this. We get caught into loving the face of the other person or the body of the other person, and we become fixated on it, and we let the tending to the relationship go to the side. Weirdly, I think that something is exactly the, the same in spirituality. When we are moving from the motion of divine love, we will often be led into social action and uh, societal transformation. But if we seek out that transformation for the sake of transformation, at the cost of forgetting about our commitment to that divine love, I think that that relationship is challenged and may eventually break. I think this is truer than I even know how to say. There is such a sweetness to be in, in the arms of the person you love. But the reason those arms are so sweet is because you love that person. Not because of those arms. The world needs transformation. And I think that you will transform it. And it will be sweet. But the reason it will be sweet is because there is a power that's calling us into this change. At least I think that's what friends will tell us if we could listen from 100 years back. I think today um, this talk called something like uh, Transforming Power, the Origins of Quaker Action. And it's a little bit of a misnomer, I think, because Quakers are uh, human just like everybody else. And a lot of times Quaker action is because we just did something <laughs> just like everybody else. But at our best, when we've been closest to the seed, when we've had our eyes opened and our ears ready to hear that change is coming, I think our action has been led by the Holy Spirit. And I think real change, real organizations, real fundraising, real policy change happens from that. In a little bit, I'll be done here. And before we get there, I want to just say a couple things. Um, I'll be around this evening, and so if um, some of you would like to talk more about any of this or about nothing else th about this, but that's something that popped in your head, I'll be around, so come find me. The second thing is, um, when I'm done, please uh, don't clap. I'm not so important, actually. <laughs> Let's settle into a little piece of quiet and see if we can't uh, figure out what the uh, operations of divine love feel like. Um, Frank Massey's here, and from the silence after me, Frank will lead us in our clothes. I have a huge list of um, bullet items from the Alternatives to Violence Project, the things that they say are the most important things for people to know if they're going to engage with the transforming power that helps society change. 
and uh, I've just crossed almost 95% of them out. And I have six little phrases left, and they're really beautiful. They're labeled on the Alternatives to Violence website as what it feels like to experience transforming power. I'm just going to read them to you. If you want to close your eyes and see if you've ever felt this, please do. Transforming power feels like something is right in the world. Transforming power feels like your fear has been lost and cannot be found. You will feel a great internal power to act on the world. With transforming power, you will feel that your responses become courageous and without hostility. With transforming power, there is a letting go of grudges. There is a sharing and an opening to the world. 